What is going on guys? This is Britter back with the Odin Project and today we're going to be starting on the CSS Foundation. So let's jump into it. In the previous lesson you learned how to write the HTML that determines how a web page is structured. The next step is to make that structure look good with some style, which is exactly what CSS is for. In this lesson we're going to focus on what we believe are some foundational CSS concepts. Things that everyone should know from the beginning, whether they are just starting out or simply need a refresher. This section contains a general overview of topics that you will learn in this session. Lesson. Add styles to HTML and CSS. Understand how to use the class and ID attributes. Add styles to specific elements using the correct selectors and understand what the cascade does. Basic syntax. At the most basic level, CSS is made up of various rules. These rules are made up of a selector more on this in a bit, and a semicolon separated list of declarations, with each of those declarations being made up of a property value pair. Note, a div is one of the basic HTML elements. It is simply an empty container. In general, it is best to use other tags such as h1 or p for content in your projects, but as we learn more about CSS, you'll find that there are many cases where the thing you need is just a container for other elements. Many of our exercises use plain divs for simplicity. Later lessons will go into much more depth about when it is appropriate to use the various HTML elements. Selectors. Selectors simply refer to the HTML elements to which CSS rules apply. They're what is actually being selected for each rule. The following subsections don't cover every selector available, but they're by far the most common and the ones you should get comfortable using first. Universal selector. The universal selector will select elements of any type, hence the name universal, and the syntax for it is simple is a simple asterisk. In the example below, every element would have the color purple style applied to it. Type selectors. A type selector or element selector will select all elements of the given element type and the syntax ju is just the name of the element. Here, all three div elements would be selected, while the p element wouldn't. Class selectors. Class selectors will select all elements with the given class, which is just an attribute you place on an HTML element. Here's how you add a class to an HTML tag and select it in CSS. Note the syntax for class selectors, a period immediately followed by the case sensitive value of the class attribute. Classes aren't required to be unique, so you can use the same class on as many elements as you want. Another thing you can do with the class attribute is to add multiple classes to a single element as a space separated list, such as class equals alert dash text severe slash dash alert. Since white space is used to separate class names like this, you should never use spaces for multi worded names and should use a hyphen instead. ID selectors. ID selectors are similar to class selectors. They select an element with the given ID which is another attribute you place on an HTML element. Instead of a period, we use a hashtag immediately followed by the case sensitive value of the ID attribute. A common pitfall is people overusing the ID attribute when they don't necessarily need to, and when classes will suffice. While there are classes where using an ID makes sense or is needed, such as taking advantage of specificity specificity or having links redirect to a section on the current page, you should use IDs sparingly, if at all. The major difference between classes and IDs is that an element can only have can only have one ID. An ID cannot be repeated on a single page and the ID attribute should not contain any white space at all. Grouping selector. What if we have two groups of elements that share some of their style declarations? Both our read and unread selectors share the color white and background color black, declarations, but otherwise have several of their own unique declarations. To cut down on the repetition, we can group these two selectors together as a comma separated list. Both of the examples above, with and without grouping, will have the same result, but the second example reduces the repetition of declarations and makes it easier to edit either the color or background color for both classes at once. Chaining selectors. Another way to use selectors is to chain them as a list without any separation. Let's say we have the following HTML. We have two elements with the subsection class that have some sort of unique styles. 
But what if we only want to apply a separate rule to the element that also has header as a second class? Well, we could chain both the class selectors together in our CSS like so. What subsection header does is it selects any element that has both the subsection and header classes. Notice how there isn't any space between the subsection and header class selectors. This syntax basically works for chaining any combination of selectors except for chaining more than one type selector. This can also be used to chain a class ID and an ID as shown below. You can take the two elements above and combine them with the following. In general, you can't chain more than one type selector since an element can't be two different types at once. For example, chaining two type selectors like div and p would give us the selector div p, which wouldn't work since the selector would try to find a literal div p element which doesn't exist. Descendant combinator. Combinators allow us to combine multiple selectors differently than either grouping or chaining them as they show a relationship between the selectors. There are four types of combinators in total, but for right now, we're going to only show you the descendant combinator, which is represented in CSS by a single space between selectors. A descendant combinator will only cause elements that match the last selector to be selected. If they also have an ancestor, a parent, grandparent, etc., that matches the previous selector. So something like ancestor child would select an element with the class child. If it has an ancestor with the class ancestor, another way to think of it is child will only be selected if it is nested inside of an ancestor no matter how deep. Take a quick look at the example below and see if you can tell which element would be selected based on the CSS rule provided. So we got ancestor.content. So ancestor um, in the above example the first two elements with the contents Class B and C would be selected, but the last element D would not. A, B, C, D. Yeah, because it has to be ancestor first. There's really no limit to how many combinators you can add to a rule, so one, two, three, four would be totally valid. This would just select an element that has a class of four. If it has an ancestor with a class of three, and if that ancestor has its own ancestor with a class of two, and so on. You generally want to avoid trying to select elements that need this level of nesting, though, as it can get pretty confusing and long, and it can cause issues when it comes to specificity. Properties to get started with. There are some CSS properties that you're going to be using all the time, or at the very least, more often than not. We're going to introduce you to several of these properties. Though this is by no means a complete list, learning the following properties will simply be enough to help you get you started. Color and background color. The color property sets an element's text color while background color sets, well, the background color of an element. I guess we're done here. Almost. Both of these properties can accept one of several kinds of values. A common one is a keyword, such as an actual color name like red or the transparent keyword. They also accept hex, RGB, and HSL values, which you may be familiar with if you've ever used a Photoshop program or a site where you could customize your profile colors. Take a quick look at CSS legal color values to see how you can adjust the opacity of these colors by adding an alpha value. So let's go ahead and click on that. Try it yourself. So like if we change this to B, did that change the color? To run. Yep, it totally changed that. Alright, let's go out of this and go back to here we go. Typography basics and text align. Font family can be a single value or a comma separate list of values that determine what font an element uses. Each font will fall into one of two categories, either a font family name like Times New Roman, we use quotes due to the white space between words, or a generic family name like Sans Serif. Generic family names never use quotes. If a browser cannot find or does not support the first font in a list, it will use the next one, then the next one, and so on until it finds a supported and valid font. This is why it's best practice to include a list of values for this property. Starting with the font, you want to be used most and ending with a generic font family as a fallback. 
font family, Times New Roman, sans serif. Font size will, as the property name suggests it, set the size of the font. When giving a value to this property, the value should not contain any white space. So font size, 22 pix, has no space between the 22 and the pixels. Font weight affects the boldness of text, assuming the font supports the specified weight. This value can be a keyword, font weight bold, or a number one between 1 and 1,000, e.g. font weight 700, the equivalent of bold. Usually, the numeric values will be in increments of 100 up to 900, though this will depend upon the font. Text align will align text horizontally within an element, and you can use the common keywords you might have come across in word processors as the value for this property, like center. Image height and width. Images aren't the only elements that we can adjust the height and width on, but we want to focus on them specifically in this case. By default, an image element's height and width values will be the same as the actual image file's height and width. If you wanted to adjust the size of the image without causing it to lose its proportions, you would use a value of auto for the height property and adjust the width value. For example, if an image's original size was 500 pix height and 1000 pix width, using the above CSS would result in a height of 250 pixels. It's best to include both of these properties for image elements, even if you don't plan on adjusting the values from the image's file's original ones. When these values aren't included, if an image takes longer to load than the rest of the page contents, the image won't take up any space on the page at first, but will suddenly cause a drastic shift of the other page contents once it does load in. Explicitly stating a height and width prevents this from happening, as space will be reserved on the page and will just appear as a blank space until the, lo the image loads. The cascade of CSS. Sometimes we may have rules that conflict with one another and we end up with some unexpected results, but I want these paragraphs to be blue. Why are they red like these other paragraphs? As frustrating as this can be, it's important to understand that CSS doesn't just do things against our wishes. CSS only does what we tell it to do. One exception to this is the default styles that are provided by a browser. These default styles vary from browser to browser and they are why some elements create a large gap between themselves and other elements or why buttons look the way they do, despite us not writing any CSS rules to style them that way. So if you end up with some unexpected behavior like this, it's either because of these default styles or due to not understanding how a property works or not understanding this little thing called the cascade. The cascade is what determines which rules actually get applied to our HTML. There are different factors that the cascade uses to determine this, three of which we'll go over to hopefully help you avoid as many of this frustrating I hate CSS moments. Specificity. A CSS declaration that is more specific will take precedence over less specific ones. Inline styles, which we will go over in the adding CSS to HTML section towards the end of the lesson, have the highest specificity compared to selectors. While each type of selector has its own specificity level that contributes to how specific a declaration is, other selectors contribute to specificity, but we're focusing only on the ones mentioned in this lesson. ID selectors are the most specific selector. Class selectors, type selectors. Specificity will only take, be taken into account when an element has multiple conflicting declarations targeting it, sort of like a tiebreaker. An ID selector will always be any number of class selectors. A class selector will always be any number of type selectors. And a type selector will always be any number of anything less specific than it. With no, when no declaration has a selector with a higher specificity, a larger amount of a single se selector will be a smaller amount of that same selector. Let's take a few quick examples to visualize how specificity works. Consider the following HTML and CSS code. In the example above, both rules are only using class selectors, but rule two is more specific because it is using more class selectors, so the color red declaration would take precedence. Now let's change things a little bit. In the example above, despite rule two having more class selectors than ID selectors, rule number one is more specific because ID beats class. In this case, the color blue declaration would take precedence. So ID beats class.
In this final example, both roles are using the ID and class selector, so neither role is using a more specific selector than the other. The cascade then checks the amounts of each selector type. Both roles only have one ID selector, but rule 2 has more classes, class selectors, so rule 2 has a higher specificity. While the color red declaration would take precedence, the background color yellow declaration would still be applied since there's no conflicting declaration for it. When comparing selectors, you may come across special symbols for the universal selector, as well as combinators and an, em and an empty space. These symbols do not add any specificity in and of themselves. Here, both rule 1 and rule 2 have the same specificity. Rule 1 uses a chaining selector, no space, and rule 2 uses a descendant combinator, the empty space. But both rules have two classes, and the combinator symbol itself does not add to the specificity. This example shows the same thing, even though rule 2 is using a child combinator. This does not change the specificity value. Both rules still have two classes, so they have the same specificity specificity values. In this example, rule 2 would have the higher specificity and the orange value would take precedence for this element. Rule 2 uses a type selector which has the lowest specificity value, but rule 1 uses the universal selector which has no specificity value. Inheritance. Inheritance refers to certain CSS properties that, when applied to an element, are inherited by that element's descendants even if we don't explicitly write a rule for those descendants. Typography, based properties, color, font size, font family, etc. are usually inherited, while most other properties aren't. The exception to this is when directly targeting an element, as this always beats inheritance. Despite the parent element having a higher specificity with an ID, the child element would have the color blue style applied since that declaration directly targets it, while color red from the parent is only inherited. Rule order. The final factor, the end of the line, the tiebreaker of the tiebreaker. Let's say that after every other factor has been taken into account, there are still multiple conflicting rules targeting an element. How does the cascade determine which rule to apply? Really simply, actually, whichever rule was the last defined is the winner. For an element that has both the alert and warning classes, the cascade would run through every other factor, including inheritance, none here, and specificity, neither rule is more specific than the other, since the warning rule was the last one to find and no other factor was able to determine which rule to apply, it's the one that gets applied to the element. Adding CSS to HTML. Okay, we went over quite a bit so far. The only thing left for now is to go over how to add all the CSS to our HTML. There are three methods to do so. External CSS. External CSS is the most common method you will come across, and it involves creating a separate file for the CSS and linking it inside of an HTML's opening and closing head tags with a self-closing link element. First, we add a self-closing link element inside of the opening and closing head tags of the HTML file. The heref attribute is the location of the CSS file, either an absolute URL or what you'll be utilizing a URL relative to the location of the HTML file. In our example above, we are assuming both files are located in the same directory. The rel attribute is required and it is specifies the relationship between the HTML file and the linked file. Then inside of the newly created styles.css file, we have the selector, the div, and p followed by a pair of opening and closing curly braces, which create a declaration block. Finally, we place any declarations inside of the declaration block. Color white is one declaration, with color being property and white being the value, and the background color black is another declaration. A note on file names. Styles.css is just what we went with as a file name here. You can name the file whatever you want as long as the file type is .css, though style or styles is most commonly used. A couple of the pros to this method are, it keeps our HTML and CSS separated, which results in the HTML file being smaller and making things look cleaner. We only need to edit the CSS in one place, which is especially handy for websites with many pages that all share similar styles. Internal CSS. Internal CSS, or embedded CSS, involves adding the CSS within the HTML file itself instead of creating a completely separate file. With the internal method, you place all the rules inside a pair of opening and closing style tags, which are then placed inside of the opening and closing head tags of your HTML file. Since styles are being placed directly inside of the head tags, we no longer need a link element 
that the external method requires. Besides these differences, the syntax is exactly the same as the external method, selector, curly braces, declarations. This method can be useful for adding unique styles to a single page of a website, but it doesn't keep things separate like the external method. And depending on how many rules and declarations there are, it can cause the HTML file to get pretty big. Inline CSS. Inline CSS makes it possible to add styles directly to HTML elements, though this method isn't as recommended. The first thing to note is that we don't actually use any selectors here since the styles are being added directly to the opening div tag itself. Next, we have the style attribute with, with its value within the pair of quotation marks being declaration. If you need to add a unique style for a single element, this method can work just fine. Generally though, this isn't exactly a recommended way for adding CSS to HTML for a few reasons. It can quickly become pretty messy once you start adding a lot of declarations to a single element causing your HTML file to become unnecessarily bloated. If you want many elements to have the same style, you would have to copy paste the same style to each individual element, causing lots of unnecessary repetition and more bloat. Any inline CSS will override the other two methods, which can cause unexpected results. While we won't dive into it here, this can actually be taken advantage of. All right, and now we're to our assignment. So it says to go to our CSS exercise repository, read the readme, and only do the exercise in the foundation directory in the order they're listed, starting with one CSS methods and ending with six cascade fix. Remember the recipe page you created as practice from the previous lesson? Well, it's rather plain looking, isn't it? Let's fix that by adding some CSS to it. How you actually style it is completely open, but you should use the external CSS method for this practice and moving forward. You should also try to use several of the properties mentioned in this little section above. Color, background color, typography, properties, etc. Take some time to play around with the various properties to get a feel for what they do. For now, don't worry at all about making it look good. This is just to practice and get used to writing CSS, not to make something to show off on your resume. So feel free to go a little crazy for now. We haven't covered how to use a custom font for the font family property yet, so for now take a look at CSS fonts for a generic list font families to use and the CSS web safe fonts for a list of fonts that are web safe. Web safe means that these are fonts that are installed on basically every computer or device, but be sure to still include a generic font family as a fallback. Alright, so we are at the 22 minute mark, so I'm going to go ahead and end this video here and then I'm going to get us set up and we'll do our assignment on the next one.